Intellectual Disability and Scientific Research – From Diagnosis to Treatment Why and how do we search for the origin of intellectual disability? Intellectual disability, or mental handicap, is a neurodevelopmental disorder characterized by impaired cognitive function and adaptive behavior to complex or new situations. It affects language and logical reasoning over a continuum of severity, ranging from mild to severe. It can be diagnosed at different stages of development, at birth, in early childhood, or later, when the child starts struggling at school. Establishing an accurate diagnosis for the disease is one of the most important issues for patients and their families. A diagnosis makes it possible to understand the origin of disorder, the disease itself, and its progression, and adapt to medical follow-up and education. Families can also attend genetic counselling and learn about the possible risks of transmission. Intellectual disability has many potential causes, which explains the great heterogeneity in type and severity. These causes may be related to events that occur during brain development, including infection, intoxication, trauma, or lack of oxygen. Or they can be the result of a genetic abnormality that alters how the brain structures itself from the time the embryo is conceived. In as much as 50% of cases, we still do not know the underlying reasons for the intellectual disability. It is estimated that more than half of undiagnosed situations are due to unidentified genetic abnormalities. Scientific research makes it possible to discover new genes involved in intellectual disability every year. Reducing the diagnostic odyssey of patients is only possible through scientific progress and improved access to specialized consultations and examinations. From the moment the embryo is conceived, our body develops from a unique genetic program encoded by the genes contained in our chromosomes. Genes are composed of a succession of codes that allow the production of molecules necessary for the growth and proper functioning of the body. Variations in this code exist in all individuals. Most of them are harmless, but some severely disrupt the development and functioning of the brain and can lead to intellectual disability. High throughput sequencing is a technology that allows the identification of genetic variations, the difficulty residing in analyzing and interpreting these large datasets to establish a link between the variations seen in a gene and the disease. The discovery of a genetic anomaly is an important step for families. Generally, it does not lead to major changes in existence support, but it does make it possible to adapt the support plan and to provide specific medical follow-up. This is the case for a number of syndromes that are now well described and for which there are specific care recommendations, providing a real improvement in patient health and quality of life. Each patient thus contributes to a better knowledge of the disease and its effects and can help to advance medicine. What is the link between genetic abnormality, development and brain function? From the embryonic stage to adulthood, genetic abnormalities modify the development and functioning of the brain in several ways, depending on the function of the genes involved. They cause three main types of disturbances. Brain malformations affecting the structure of the brain. Disruptions in cellular metabolism with anomalies in the manufacturing and regulation of molecules essential to the body. Abnormalities affecting the ability of neurons, the main brain cell populations transporting information, to connect to each other, which is defined as brain plasticity. An example is a significant decrease in the size of the brain. This is called microcephaly, which restricts the development of neurons. 
or on the contrary, the brain can be abnormally large. This is called macrocephaly, which is linked to other neurological anomalies. Smaller, finer changes in brain architecture are also implicated. In such cases, one or several brain nuclei, or structures, amongst hundreds, are affected during development, and end up missing or being poorly developed. Examples include the following. A defect in the formation of grey matter due to poor migration of neurons to the cerebral cortex, which can lead to an absence of folds on the surface of the brain known as lysencephaly. A malformation of the cerebellum. An anomaly in the connection between the different areas of the brain, with a defect in the constitution of the white matter, such as in agenesis of the corpus callosum, a condition characterized by the absence of the corpus callosum, the largest white matter structure of the brain. Genetic defects can also disrupt neuronal metabolism and lead to insufficient transport of necessary substances inside the cells, inadequate protein formation, lack of energetic substrates for the cell, accumulation of toxic substances. In some cases, damage does not affect the structure of metabolism of the brain, but its plasticity. Brain plasticity is essential to acquire new skills through the many connections between neurons, as we experience and are stimulated by the environment. When cerebral plasticity is impaired, brain functions are restricted, ultimately resulting in altered information processing, inappropriate emotions and language difficulties, making it impossible for a person to adapt to the environment. Simultaneously, the brain becomes more excitable while less able to filter information and to protect itself from sensory stimuli and strong emotions. Abnormal brain development, regardless of its origin, can lead to a spectrum of intellectual disability that is often accompanied by specific identifiable disorders. Language disorders, learning delays, emotional control difficulties, etc. Abnormal brain development can cause other disorders. Intellectual disability can be accompanied, for example, by a motor disorder, epilepsy, behavioral disorders, sleep disorders, or eating disorders. In addition, a genetic defect may not be limited to neuronal cells. Other cells and organs may also be affected by its variation. The well-described genetic diseases are often characterized by symptoms that make the diagnosis likely and ensure specific medical follow-up. For this reason, recommendations are very important. Of course, even with the same genetic disease, every case is unique. Scientific research is increasingly shedding light on the complex genetic and biological processes of brain development and function. At the same time, neuroscience research is opening up new areas of exploration. All these advances are making it possible to design new cutting-edge therapeutic approaches. What treatments are possible and what research is being done? Today, we do not know how to cure intellectual disability yet. Nevertheless, therapeutic approaches can improve the development of cognitive and adaptive skills, treat disorders and symptoms, and improve overall quality of life. While it is still very difficult to act directly on the genetic anomaly and the cellular mechanisms involved, scientific knowledge has led to new therapeutic avenues. Gene therapy consists in using a virus to introduce a gene fragment into the cell. This gene fragment is designed to replace the defective gene and correct the genome. However, the brain cells, neurons, are very difficult to reach because they are carefully protected and lie inside the skull. 
Gene therapy is therefore not yet an accessible therapy for neurodevelopmental conditions and is only being tested in a few isolated cases. For several genetic diseases that affect the cell's metabolism, there are specific treatments that can improve or restore cell metabolism. Such treatments include a diet low on certain amino acids, or ketogenic diet rich in fat with non-synthesized vitamins, such as biotin or thiamine, or by providing a missing enzyme with enzyme therapy. Early diagnosis and treatment of the disease are therefore essential to limit its impact. For other diseases, it is known that the defective gene has a cascading effect on brain activity, with a disruption of the molecular pathways involved. For example, in Bourneville syndrome, which often includes intellectual disability, severe epilepsy, as well as affects many organs, it is now known as a disorder of the mTOR molecular pathway, involved in the onset of symptoms. Several drugs blocking the mTOR pathway have been developed and have shown their ability to improve certain symptoms. Another example is Fragile X syndrome, in which there is a disruption of the GABA and glutamine molecular pathways, which are important for the communication between neurons. This disruption explains many of the symptoms of Fragile X, anxiety, hypersensitivity, hyperactivity, and epileptic seizures. Many studies have considered therapeutic approaches for Fragile X syndrome, with many drugs being tested, but overall none have been effective. This shows the great difficulty associated with clinical trials in the field of neurodevelopment. In all cases, therapy aims to limit disease progression and treat as many symptoms as possible. Depending on the individual situation, tailored drug treatments, also called precision medicine, and non-drug approaches can be recommended. It is important to note that because people with intellectual disabilities have difficulty expressing themselves, the interpretation of symptoms is complex. For example, an abnormal behavior should not systematically be qualified as a psychiatric disorder because it may reveal undetected pain. A complete medical examination must be carried out with the prescription of an appropriate treatment. When necessary, the drugs that are used are those usually prescribed, tailoring them to the individual's particular situation and to what is known about the genetic disease or syndrome. In addition, drug-free measures can be offered to the patients from an early age and throughout life to help the person live a better life. It may be one or a combination of rehabilitation measures, personalized educational support, more recently developed cognitive remediation programs. In cognitive remediation therapy, an objective has to be defined for each measure of support. The therapist will help the person to mobilize their preserved capacities and to develop specific strategies that will allow them to bypass limitations and interact with the environment in a more appropriate way. Current research focuses heavily on the development of programs for learning disabilities, lack of independence, behavioral disorders or social adjustment difficulties. By better understanding the cognitive and behavioral profiles of each syndrome, neuropsychology makes it possible to improve therapeutic support. These non-drug approaches are not a cure, but they aim to improve quality of life and to support each patient's personal goals. Today's therapeutic strategies use the most recent knowledge in all fields – neurodevelopment, genetics, pharmacology, neuroscience, educational sciences. Together, let's make scientific progress! Clinical research – from molecule to medicine Thousands of molecules are studied in a therapeutic objective. All of them will not pass the different tests. 
only one will become a drug. Here is its story. First, we need to identify the molecules of interest. It starts with the understanding of the disease, its clinical and biological signs, and also the mechanisms by which a drug could reset normal function of the organism. With this knowledge, the researcher thinks of some molecules that could be active. Once synthesized, these molecules go to the preclinical phase. After performing different tests at the laboratory and before turning to human beings, it is necessary to test the molecules on animals. These tests bring useful knowledge for the future drug, especially about its toxicity. We are trying to find what is called the non-toxic maximum dose. It is not possible to test directly on human beings. At the end of the preclinical studies, the researcher has an idea of the dose he can use on humans. All studies performed on humans must be authorized and be done with the patient's agreement. After full information, voluntary participants will sign an informed consent form. It is the participant who decides if he wishes to participate or not. A first phase, called phase 1, is then performed in a small number of healthy volunteers. It is the first administration on humans. We are checking if the drug is safe to use. We are also interested on how the drug acts on the body. It is called pharmacokinetics. Phase 1 always starts with one patient alone, who receives only one dose of the drug. Then we look at the safety, and if everything is fine, we can give the drug to another patient, and so on. Then in different doses. Experts decide if it's okay. If there is a safety issue, everything can be stopped. Then phase 2 can start. In the second phase, we are trying to determine the optimal dose of the drug, the one that seems the most efficacious with the least side effects. We are trying to establish a relationship between the dose and the effect of the drug. Several doses are tested and compared. At the end of this phase, we have defined the dose that will eventually be used. In phase 3, we test the dose determined in the previous phase. Phase 3 is the phase where we want to test the efficacy of the drug. We often speak about randomized, double-blind, controlled trial versus placebo. To demonstrate the efficacy of a new treatment or therapy, we must compare and show that patients who take the treatment or therapy are doing better than those who don't take it. We talk about a controlled trial. We use a placebo, a product which does not contain any active principle. The placebo must look exactly like the study treatment. We must not be able to differentiate the placebo from the active drug. To demonstrate the efficacy of the drug, our two groups of patients, study drug versus placebo, must be comparable. To get comparable groups, we randomize, which means that we assign by chance one patient to one of the groups. Randomization equally distributes patients with specific characteristics in each group. Groups are thus comparable. To be sure that the patients receiving the placebo or the study drug are followed up equally during the trial, we use double blinding. Neither the doctor nor the patient know if they are receiving the placebo or the studied drug. Randomization and double blinding are methods that avoid what we call biases, elements which can influence the measurement and the efficacy and lead to a wrong result. Finally, it is the marketing authorization. At the end of phase three, if everything went well, a marketing authorization, MA, can be requested. Any time during the development of a medicine, everything can be stopped because of safety issues or the inefficiency of the drug. All molecules tested will not become a medicine. Lots of molecules don't make it and fail. Results of preclinical and clinical studies decide of the success of a molecule. After marketing authorization, it is not finished for our medicine. It enters real life. Other studies can be conducted. They are called phase 4 studies. 
they allow a better understanding of the medicine in real-life conditions. For instance, a better understanding of the safety of the medicine. Phase 4 clinical trials can be conducted to verify that under real-life use and in bigger size population, the medicine does not have other side effects, for example, not yet seen during clinical trials. This is why sometimes medicine can be retrieved from the market after a certain time in use. 